day that Jesus resurrected from the dead, two of his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. As they were walking, they were discussing all that happened. Jesus appeared to them. He didn't allow them to recognize who he was. And as they were walking along the road, they talked all about events surrounding Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and how the religious leaders handed him over to death. During that conversation, Jesus starts with Moses and the prophets and begins to share what the scriptures say concerning himself. When they reached the village, the men invited Jesus, unbeknownst to them, to stay for dinner. When Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them, It was at that moment that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And then Jesus was gone from them. They looked at each other and said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? We don't know all that Jesus said to them, but we do know that all through the Old Testament are images, pictures, shadows, if you will, of Jesus. We want to share some of those stories with you. During this series, we want to take you back and look at the many moments in the Old Testament that are beautiful pictures of Jesus. Take a journey with us for our series, Shadows, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament. Good morning. Oh, I'm in such a good mood this morning because our shadow of Jesus is food. I'm serious. Don't you love to eat? Oh, my gosh. I love to eat so much. I identify with the hobbits in the Lord of the Rings where they would like to eat six times a day if they can get it. And I don't know about you, but I like to eat about that many times. That's why I exercise, so I can eat more. Because I love to eat. It tastes good. It's enjoyable, but it also gives strength, doesn't it? Well, our picture... Our shadow in the Old Testament of Jesus that helps us understand him is food. It's food in the desert or manna, manna. Now, it starts a little negatively because it came to the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness. They were grumbling. They were having a tough time. They were hungry. They were weak. And uh, it was a difficult time in their existence. And they, they weren't understanding what God was doing and So we start there, we start because it's going to get good real quick, but we start because manna comes in the wilderness, all right? So we all go through that. We all go through wilderness experiences, right? With our family, our marriage, with our job, our finances, with our health. I mean, I'm your pastor and Scott and others, we know, we walk with you and we know that every one of us goes through tough times and when we're going through them, they're no fun. And the first comment I'd like to make is our troubles, our wilderness or desert experiences, make us better or worse people. Okay, so everybody suffers, everybody goes through difficult things, but that will either make us better or it will make us worse as people. So, some of us get softer and more tender because of our suffering, and other people get harder Some people, when they go through a difficult time, and I've noticed this, they get more empathetic and compassionate as a result. It's like a a credential for the rest of their life to have compassion on other people who also suffer. And then others go through the same suffering, and their result is they just get cynical. Not more empathetic, but cynical. Some people are actually humbled through their suffering, and their humility comes out. They don't understand. They don't know. They trust God. And they don't deserve anything better. And, and then you'll see the, the same suffering in the life of someone else. And it just makes them more arrogant. Nobody understands the suffering I'm going through. Like, you're really the only person in the whole world suffering. Or, you know, it can make you feel so noble and self-righteous when you add up all the things you've been through. And and again, it's not making you more humble. It's making you more arrogant. So you see this crucial difference. It can make you better or worse. Some people get stronger and they can face anything as a result. It's like a workout. It's like a, a developing of the strength of their spirit. And God makes them stronger as a result. And others get more fragile. 
when they go through the same suffering. Some people get sweeter and others just get more and more sour. And so we ask ourselves, what is the difference? What is crucial? And one of the answers is experiencing Jesus when you're in the desert. Do you know what he's like? Do you know what? And this picture this morning is unforgettable. And I don't want you to miss Jesus in your wilderness. Because I know you're all, we all go through it, and I hope it doesn't, but you or someone you love, it may as well be you, it might even be harder if it's somebody you love, and, and, and it's just not fun, it's not a good time, and it's, it's scary, it's painful. But then the greatest consolation is Jesus manifests himself as the bread from heaven in your desert. Okay, and that's a sweet, strengthening presence that I don't want you to miss. And so the shadow of the Old Testament, Jesus will claim it in the New Testament boldly, and we'll read that scripture, is going to present a Jesus that will make the difference for you, not if, but when you suffer. And it can actually make you stronger and better and accomplish whatever the purpose of that suffering is so you can move through it and be done and on your way to the promised land on your way to the land flowing with milk and honey, where God wants to bless you. Okay, so with that, um, let me set up the scripture. Two weeks ago, before our 4th of July message on freedom, which was just like a one-off, we were talking about the picture of the Passover lamb. And that's just before the manna came. Okay? Um, God instructed his people to put the blood of an innocent lamb on the doorposts of their house, and then he would pass over them, and they would not experience the death of the firstborn, which was the tenth plague that set them free, finally set them free from Egypt. Okay, you remember that? And now it's been 45 days since that happened. They actually were set free. All the folks in Egypt who didn't have the, door, uh, the, the blood on the doorpost, uh, their firstborn died. And that convinced Pharaoh to let the people go, God's people, Israel. And so they left, and it's been 45 days. They crossed the Red Sea. God destroyed the soldiers behind them. They had that super memory of the ten plagues and the Exodus, including the Passover. And then they had the Red Sea rescue and and deliverance there with the horse and rider of the Pharaoh's army. And then it's been 45 days, and they're in the desert in the middle of nowhere. And God specifically led them and dropped them off in the middle of nowhere with no food service, two million people. And, and again, this was not a, an accident or, or you know, an, just, just, oh, I didn't think about it. It was the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day that was specifically leading them. Now, sometimes we have suffering in our life and it's because we got off the path. But then sometimes we're following Jesus and that made us walk right into the desert. God specifically leads us, and as a result, we are hungry, we are grouchy, we are uh, weak and tired and all, whatever it is that, that you're going through, you're thinking, what did I do? Well, I didn't do anything. God led me here, and now he's got some reason for this. And so that's where we are. The people are are not in the land flowing with milk and honey yet. That's Canaan. That's coming. But they're on the way there from Egypt. And they're in the middle of the barren desert. And they're not doing well. They're very hungry. And God is actually testing them. And again, they're flunking the test. Okay, you'll hear it as we read the scripture. I'm going to read selected verses from Exodus 16. You can read the whole chapter this week if you'd like. There's a lot more in the story. I'm going to focus not on the whole story, but just as it helps present the picture of Jesus as the manna in the wilderness. Okay, so it's a very focused approach. So let me just read a few select verses from Exodus 16. We'll read first verses 2 through 5. In the desert, the whole community, this is the Israelite people, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron were the leaders representing God, and so they're catching all the criticism and the unhappiness from the people. But it's really directed at God. Verse 3, the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Does that sound like some serious whining? If only we had died by the Lord's hand. And this is 45 days after the 10 plagues in the Red Sea. Okay. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you 
Moses and Aaron, you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. (laughs) Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. All right, now I'm going to skip to verse 13, and we'll read to verse 21. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone... Thin flakes like like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the armor, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. And it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. And then finally, let's just skip to verse 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna, which means, what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. All right, now... Let me read through, uh, four verses from Jesus, his teaching in John 6 on the bread of life. Okay, Jesus said in John 6, 32 to 35, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Okay, there you have it. Again, another shadow of the substance that comes in the New Testament, the substance of Jesus, the shadow being manna, the substance being Jesus as the bread of life or the true bread from heaven. Now, to stick with my focus and not just teach the story we read about the manna, I want to give you just four points about uh, how the manna and Jesus are similar. Okay, so first of all, the first parallel is first, the manna and Jesus were both or are both in the wilderness. The manna and Jesus are both in the wilderness. Now, God's plan was to take his people out of Egypt. That was a big emphasis two weeks ago, and the Passover, and the final plague, and the salvation. And for us, spiritually, that's like our salvation from sin, from slavery to sin. And this world, and and that life-changing testimony, and just that exodus out of whatever it is that we're you know, suffering with, and God brings us out. Then he wanted to bring them in to the promised land, but in the middle, there was the wilderness. And it wasn't just geography. It wasn't just, well, you know, on our way there, we're going to have to pass through, so let's make the best of it. No, there was a purpose for the wilderness. We can see it in the shadow. Before we see it in the substance, we can see in the shadow that God used the wilderness. It was intentional. He kept them in the wilderness for some time. It wasn't just a straight line to the promised land. Now, come on now, let's go conquer these people. He had a lot of preparation to do for these folks who had just been slaves. It wasn't going to be like overnight that they would become an army and ready to possess the land of Canaan. So he takes them through the wilderness. All right, so it wasn't their destination, but it was huge. It was their preparation. All right? 
It wasn't where they were going to wind up, all the promises and the blessings. So it was initially very disappointing. Why are we still here? And the leader people, the vision-oriented people are like, come on, God, let's finish, let's get there already. And God's like, no, it's been 45 days, we're still in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and the people are like, who's leading this? Who is leading us? Moses and Aaron. And Moses and Aaron are like, hey, this is God. He's got the cloud. You can see it like I can. He's right there in the sky. He's brought us here. It's, it's, it's the first thing we need to do long before the land of milk and honey. So it was a place where God could form a nation out of these people without the presence of any other ungodly people, any other ungodly nations like Egypt or all those Canaanite people. The stuff they were doing was unbelievable, and the influence of that was scary. And so God's like, I'm going to put you out here away from any uh, negative influence and also away from all the typical things you trust, okay, all the di different things you, you trust to live. Even things for your own survival. You will not be able to hunt. You will not be able to fish to feed yourself. So I purposely arranged for that so that you will get hungry and then you will have to look to me. Because one of the big lessons in the wilderness isn't just that I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments and the law and the tabernacle system. And oh, and you'll learn how to experience me through that. But it's also that I want to teach you to follow my instructions. I want to teach you to trust me and to obey me. And, and so we're going to do that out here in the wilderness. I, I want you to learn dependence on me in a fresh way every day. Because you can't just go to the store. And you can't just use your own hard work and ingenuity to feed yourself and you're hungry. And the only answer is me. And you're going to have to learn to trust me. And, and so this is the purpose for uh, the wilderness. Um. Again, not a happy place. It's scary. It's painful. Um, we, when we are in our own wilderness, we're weak. We're hungry. It's a place that's barren. It's devoid of all life. There's no inspiration. And so we're like, why? I don't like this. God, what's the, I, is this it? Is this what I got from following you? <laughs> this is what the people are going through. And again, they're not at their best. Well, that's where the manna came. It was in a place like that. And... Now I want you to notice Jesus, who is the manna from heaven, also was in the wilderness. Remember when he finally finished being a carpenter and being anonymous in Nazareth and he finally had the spirit come on him in a powerful way after his baptism with John the Baptist and a dove came down and he was anointed. He was ready to hit the, the ground running. He was going to go preach and heal and do all these things and have this huge public ministry all over Israel. What did he do first? The Spirit came on him, and it says the Spirit led him where? Into the wilderness to be tested. All right? Now, in his case, he didn't receive the manna. He was the manna. But I want you to see him there. He is in the wilderness. He went there for 40 days and nights and just, he was fasting, he was starving, but he himself, the food... In the wilderness. So, so if you're in a wilderness, I just want to tell you Jesus is there. Jesus knows what that's like. Jesus himself, his life could be pictured by a wilderness. So much of it, a man of sorrow, suffering, hanging on the cross for us eventually, making the ultimate sacrifice, never owned anything, poor, no possessions, never a place to lay his head, always on the go. Um, his perfect life, very much in the wilderness. So if you're, if you're in a tough time and it's barren and it's not encouraging and you're hungry and, you, and, you, and you, you, you feel that scariness and that pain, hey, Jesus is there. The manna comes in the wilderness, in the shadow, and with Jesus. He's in. Don't miss him. Don't miss Jesus. He's right there in whatever struggle you have. If it's marriage, if it's a ch one of your children, your family, a, a close relative? Is it, if it's a job, a financial thing, if it's, if it's health? I don't know. What is it for you that is like you would just say, God, what is this? Let me tell you, Jesus is there, and he understands, and he's accessible, and he wants to be manna for you. All right, but the first thing to see is he's there. So manna and Jesus are in the wilderness. Second, the manna and Jesus are both mysterious. 
so, so I'm just calling him briefly into mind when they looked at the man and they said, what is it? And let's call it, what is it? Hey, have you gone outside yet and collected what is it? Because that's what they called it. Hey, what is this? They've never seen it before. It's mysterious. Like, what in the world is this? <laughs> and there was a humility about the way God is providing, about the way that God is, is working in our struggle, in our trial. So let me just say, if you're in a difficult situation, a lot of the pain and the making it worse on our part is when we are not humble, when we think we know, and we try to backseat drive for God, and we're like, God, what are you doing? I think I know better. Or at least answer these questions. And so there's this big struggle. And it's kind of like it was with Job when he, his struggle of his book was like, I'm trying to figure God out, and why in the world is he doing this stuff? Instead of just, just admitting, I don't know. We'll just call it, what is it? We don't understand. We don't know a lot. And in a trial or a struggle, we don't know. And God doesn't tell us what he's doing and all the ways he's working. And so you'll find, and I find, that, that the, it doesn't make it any easier to try and reason with God. And when Job finally let God be God, that solved a lot of his problems, made it so much easier for him. The manna, how God provides, even how he's working and why he's even led us into the wilderness, he doesn't always explain. And we, we need to be humble and say, I don't know. I don't need to know. God knows a lot more than me. It's above my pay grade. And, uh, and so I don't have to argue or try to figure it all out. Don't need all my questions answered. Okay, so that's the manna. And Jesus is the same way. He's mysterious. He didn't always explain his teaching. He looked for us to just believe and trust him and be committed to following him, even when we didn't understand. Why are we here? Why is the road like this? Okay. Thirdly, the manna and Jesus are both undeserved. Both undeserved. All right, now let's look at the grumbling again, because this is where it comes out. God gave the people the manna when they were grumbling. Exodus 6, verse 3, If only we had died by the Lord's hand. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted in Egypt. That's the language of addiction. They're forgetting what it was really like when they were slaves and miserable and crying out for God to save them in Egypt. And as they sit 45 days later in the wilderness, they're thinking, we had it so good in Egypt. We had all this food and we were all blah, blah, blah. They're, they're forgetting the way it really was. They're denying the reality, even after their salvation, they're denying the reality of their slavery. And they're also forgetting that God just had saved them. And so they blame their, their exodus on Moses and on Aaron. And Aaron and Moses are like, I didn't part the Red Sea. I didn't bring the ten plagues. How could you forget? This was so obviously God that brought us out here. What are you talking about? Well, their empty stomachs are talking. Their tired bodies are talking. Their, their frustration with that they're not at the land of Canaan yet is talking. And it's not, it's not really the truth. And so this is the point when they're like this. They're at their worst. They're, they're not doing well. They're failing the test. This is when God gives them the manna. And then, and this is what I couldn't believe. So God starts to give them the manna, even when they're like this. And then he finally eventually gets them up to the land. And he says, all right, let's be brave now. Come on, we're going to go in. We're going to conquer these people. And they go in and they scout it out and they come back and they go, oh, they're, they're scary. We'll never, we're scared. We're not going to do it. We're not going to trust God to go in and conquer the land. So God says, okay, if you won't trust me, then you're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years and die. Well, they did. And he still gave them manna every day. Fresh, delicious manna from heaven, peered on the ground, that kind of provision, that kind of tenderness, that kind of care in the midst of the wilderness for 40 years, even when they failed to believe God and move forward, he still gave them the manna. The manna was undeserved. It came to people who were grumbling, who were not at their best. And listen, Jesus is the same way. Jesus came for sinners. We know this, but let's just be reminded, Jesus, I did not come for the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. I came for those who are lost. My whole goal, Jesus said, is, is, to, is to come for sinful people who don't deserve me. 
And so God gave us the ultimate manna, his son. When we were yet sinners, he sent Christ to die for us. And it's always that way. We never deserve it. And especially when we're in the wilderness. When we're in the wilderness, we're not at our best and we're confused and we're more aware of our weaknesses, our faults, our failures than ever. And, and that whole time, we don't need, you know, we, we need help. We need grace. Well, under this section, there was the whole idea that they were tested. Um, in verse 4 and verse 27 of Exodus 16, it says the manna was actually a test to see if they would follow his instructions. So he's like, hey, don't keep it overnight. Did they follow that instruction? No. Hey, gather on the sixth day enough for two so you don't work on the seventh. No, they went out on the seventh and there was no uh, manna on the seventh. They didn't follow the instruction. They failed the test. (laughs) Well, let me just say, the tests are given, we're used to tests for education or other jobs, things like that, that either qualify or disqualify us. And we don't realize this is a very different kind of test. Okay? When God tests us, he's not testing us to see if we're good enough. He is testing us And when he does, he knows that we failed, and we know that we failed. And we're like, thank you. If you want to give me a test like that, I'll go ahead and write an F at the top. I didn't need you to tell me that. I've already been failing and struggling here in the desert. And God's like, I'm going to test you. Oh, that's all I need is just a test to tell me what a failure I am. And God's like, that's not the kind of test. I'm not just trying to show you your failure. I'm trying to improve you. Like a father taking his 11-year-old son into the woods to a cabin to teach him to chop wood and stoke a fire. And if the son doesn't get it right, what does the father do to the 11-year-old son? He helps him. He tries harder to get. I am testing you to encourage your progress. I am testing you to see where you need progress, help you see it, and I'm staying with you if it takes 40 years. I am testing you to get this right. I want to see it have a good result. I'm not trying to flunk you, exclude you, disqualify you. No, I'm your loving Heavenly Father, and I'm testing you to encourage, to promote, to take you forward. I I brought you out of Egypt. Now I want to take you all the one, get you ready. And that's what the test is for. It's just to make you better. It's to make you stronger. It's to get you ready for, for what I have for you, which is not the wilderness, not the desert, but something A land flowing with milk and honey. And to that extent, when I give you Jesus, it's a test. Trust me. Follow my instruction. Obey me. But it's all grace. Jesus is grace, and so is the manna in the wilderness. Fourth, the manna and Jesus are both enjoyable and encouraging. And I already introduced this at the beginning of the message, why I'm in such a good mood this morning. I don't know if you can tell, but I am, because I love food. And this is telling me that my Jesus and telling all of us that our Jesus should be delightful. Okay, now the wafers and honey, you have to remember, back then they didn't have candy or sweets like we do. And so for them, when they talk about honey, like the word of God is like honey, it's, uh, it's a much stronger expression than maybe we realize because we're not as into honey because we've got donuts and cookies and chocolate and right so when they say that the manna tasted like wafers and honey they're saying basically it's donut world (laughs) or Krispy Kreme or whatever dessert you love something you enjoy eating the experience enjoy that's the manna that's what it was like for them for 40 years now I know it was the same thing over and over but it was fresh It was fresh from God, and it tasted good, okay? And and not only that, but there was this sense of trust. A couple of days ago, I was coming back from a visit in Columbus, and I was late for lunch. I missed one of my six meals of the day. And I'm driving back into town, and I'm just, like, fading away into my car. I'm like, oh, God, I can't make it. Finally got to my meal, and I was like, yes, okay? Now, if you don't have that kind of appetite or if you, don't, uh, if you eat more regularly too, you may not realize or try to remember back the last time that you had to fast, a medical fast, a spiritual fast, sometime when you were weak and then you ate 
There's a tremendous sense of enjoyment and taste, but there's also a tremendous sense of strength. I, I know whenever I fast, I can't exercise. I can't concentrate. And then when I eat, I've got this tremendous strength that comes immediately. We should expect that from Jesus, the manna from heaven. We should expect out of our relationship, especially when we're made hungry in the desert, when we're even more weak and, and tired from our struggles that God leads us into, then we are set up to come to Christ and say, you are the manna from heaven. I don't deserve you, but you're here and you taste good. You're here and you are an enjoyable, delightful experience for me. And not only that, but you'll strengthen me so that I don't just wander in this wilderness, but go straight through it. I don't want to be in it any longer than I have to be. And this is what we all can have from Jesus. He's like, he's like let me strengthen you and you'll go straight through the valley. Instead of lay down or get lost and make it swell up, make it worse. You'll go straight through. And before you know it, you'll be on the other side and you'll look back and you'll say, you were my manna in the wilderness. Sweet strength. Sweet strength. It's an unforgettable picture and we need it. If we're going to become better and stronger in our desert wilderness experiences, Jesus was and the manna were both enjoyable and encouraging. And then finally, um, the last point, uh, the manna and Jesus were both daily. The manna and Jesus were both daily. And I want to take you now to communion. See, we regularly do this because the, the manna and Jesus as the ultimate manna came regularly and we eat it. We take Jesus in regularly. You can't store this up. You can't think about the future and say, well, you know, I don't want to trust you, God. I, I came to you for salvation and for forgiveness of sin and I'll see you in a few months or years when I really have a crisis. No, God's like, no, every day I want to do a miracle like the miracle of your salvation. And so, Pray every day, come daily to me, and you'll have fresh testimonies and stories of my power in your life. God wants to give us fresh manna every day, every day. So the same faith we use to get saved, that we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, you know, I'm in a tough spot. I'm, I'm in a difficult situation, and, and it's scary and it's painful and, I, and, and you've, you've let me get hungry. And, and, and so I'm reaching out to you. I'm depending on you today. Hey, maybe for the first time you come to Jesus like that and he's used some crisis to get your attention. Well, then today you can receive him and he'll come and forgive your sin. He'll come and for the first time be that manna that gives you life. You can just take him today. This is, this is the symbol of how we do it, but... The, the, the wafer is his body, the cup is his blood. It's him, we're basically taking him in, like the manna, like he is the, the manna, and we're, we're meant to eat him. He becomes a part of us. We bring him inside, and then he, it's him and us, and us and him, and, and, and that's the way we're saved. Now, if you've never done that, do that today. So say, and I pray this sermon will be so much more than a sermon, that it would be a time where the manna of Jesus just shows up. It just shows up, and you can gather it. See, it was there, but they had to gather it and then eat it. And so right now, by faith, just take Jesus and, yes, thank you, Jesus. Forgive my sin, and, and I need you, so I'll take you in. I'll take you in. Change me. It's a simple, childlike, almost awkward thing where you just admit and believe and receive and confess. It's nothing heroic, but it's the same thing. Now, if you've already done that, it's the same thing. Do it again. When's the last time you, you came to Jesus with the same faith that saved you? Only for fresh, fresh blessing and strength and fresh encouragement and fresh wisdom. And, and, and that's what I'm asking you to do. I mean, as we take this communion, come to Jesus with that same desperation. Jesus, I'm gathering you and I'm, I'm taking you in right now. Would you please give me the strength, the encouragement I need to make it through my wilderness? on a straight line right through the valley all the way to your promises for my life. Okay, so Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it to remember me.
And then he said after dinner, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the shadows and the substance. Thank you for the pictures and, and this one today, that you are the manna from heaven. Oh Lord, be enjoyable, be encouraging, be real to us, give us strength, make us better. Even when you lead us through the wilderness, make us better and stronger. Bless us now, Lord, as we worship. We are so impressed with you in these pictures. Let us never forget that you are our manna. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.